Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, tool steels. So what are tool steels and why should you care? Well, let's start at the top. Tool steels are basically a category of hardenable steel. So if you go down to Home Depot and there's a bin full of steel, it says welding steel, that steel, I don't care what you do to it, it will never get hard. Um, so try as you might, you'll never be able to make a decent knife or cutting tool out of it. Um, I mean, it's harder than a bag of chicken livers, but it's not hard enough to do anything with that a knife maker or tool maker would want to do. So if you're a knife maker or even if you work in fabrication or a machine shop or you know, anything like that, anybody that uh, deals with steel, really nice to know about tool steel. So there's a general category of steels that contains over 0.5% carbon uh, and generally a good bit more than that that can be heat treated and cooled in a way that makes them get quite hard. So in the U.S., these are designated with a letter followed by uh, numbers. So uh, most of the, some of the most common ones are W1, A2, D2, and O1. But there are tons of other ones. Uh, you'll see S5, S7, H13, M2. Now, not all steels that are useful for knife making are designated as tool steels. So why would a knife maker want to know specifically about tool steels? Well, uh, these are pretty commonly available steels. You can get them from a lot of places and in fairly small quantities in ways that you can't necessarily with cutlery steels. Um, lots of industrial supply places stock them, uh, Granger and some places like that. So, you know, if you need something uh, and you just want to run out and get it uh, from a local store, sometimes you can do that in a way that you can't with fancier steels. In these days of the internet and one-click shopping and all that, um, it, it's less necessary to know about them than maybe it was 30 years ago. But uh, sometimes you just want to get something real quick and maybe there's a store down the way that you can run out to and get it and also save yourself the cost of shipping. So the key to figuring out what kind of steel you want to use is to look at the attributes of the steel and see how it fits your application and the tools that you have. These would include functional qualities like abrasion resistance, corrosion resistance, hardness, shock resistance, edge holding, hot working qualities, all that sort of thing, as well as more process related qualities like the ease of heat treatment, stability during heat treatment, machinability, formability, and so on. In other words, if a particular steel looks perfect, but you don't have the gear to heat treat it correctly, then it doesn't do you a damn bit of good. So you gotta get something that is both going to function like you want it to and that you're capable of heat treating. Now I'm going to focus on knife making steels here but for those of you who might be working in machine shops, fabrication or you know just guys who love tinkering in the garage I'm going to mention a couple others along the way that might be more helpful to you than they would be to knife makers. So uh, tool steels are typically sold in the form of drill rod as well as in the form of flat stock. Uh, if you're going to be forging, you can just grab a piece of drill rod, a big round piece of steel, uh, you know, heat it up and whack it into shape. Likewise, if you're making a knife uh, or maybe some kind of shop tool or die or fixture, um, you can also find flat stock that's more useful for that. When steel's produced at the mill, there's generally a very thin skin of steel that has a lower carbon content than the specs for that steel would call for, and that's not good. Typically, though not always, tool steel, unlike many other kinds of steel, is sold with all of that decarburization ground off. In that case, it's usually sold so that it's slightly over the nominal size of the stock. But it's also sold in what's known as precision ground form, meaning that it's sold with the specifications of being within, let's say, one thousandth of an inch to the nominal size. What that means is that, let's say it was sold as 0.250 inches thick, it'll be no smaller than 0.249 inches and no greater than 0.251. And that's just, you know, an example. Now for knife makers, the downside is that you may not need all that precision. Why? Because precision is made out of money. So if you're just gonna heat up steel and smash it with a hammer, paying for all that extra precision may not make any sense. 
But, you know, if you're going to be making 10 stock removal knives and you want to, you know, be able to assemble them maybe with interchangeable parts or you don't want to have to go out and grind a bunch of uh, scale off of the, the knife, all that precision might be really handy. So, uh, let's look at the most common steels available. But first, this. <laughs> So the most basic tool steel is called W1. Uh, it contains about 1% carbon, a small fraction of a percent of manganese, and the rest is iron. Now this makes it pretty similar to 1095 steel, um, which is a really commonly available high carbon steel. The main difference is that the specs for W1 are just a little bit tighter than for 1095. So if you see something in a catalog that's sold as quote unquote water hardening tool steel, and it doesn't say anything else, it's almost always gonna be W1. This means that it's relatively simple to heat treat. You just heat it up to cherry red, dunk it in a bucket of water, presto, gets hard. There's also sort of a kissing cousin W2, about the same composition, but with a tiny amount of vanadium added, which helps with wear resistance, and it also has some kind of abstruse heat treating advantages. Now, personally, I prefer W2 over W1 in all cases, but unfortunately, W2 is not widely available. A lot of forging guys use it, though, but you have to kind of find it from specialty vendors in most cases. So probably the most common tool steel is called O1. The O is not a zero, it's, a, it's a, the letter O, and it stands for oil hardening. Um, it differs from W1 pretty much just in that it has more manganese. So without getting into the nuances of uh, heat treating, basically this means you can just heat it up to cherry red with a blowtorch or something. You can dunk it in oil rather than water and it'll fully harden. So why would that be better than, than water hardening? Well, oil hardening is way less likely to cause parts to crack than if you quench in water. Water quenching is always kind of a roll of the dice. Things just crack and ugh, it's, it's awful. So as a result, to me, O1 is a much better starter steel for beginning knife makers. Except for one thing, and that's expense. Uh, if you're doing stock removal, no problem, definitely worth the trade-off. Uh, but if you're forging, on the other hand, you, you kind of have to weigh whether that extra expense is worth the trouble. I mean, typically O1 costs like five or six times as much. I'm talking about precision ground O1 here. Typically costs about five or six times as much as a piece of 1095, 1080, something like that. Mill stock, which still has scale on it and all that sort of thing. Next, A2. Now, A2 is fairly similar to O1, but with the addition of about 5% chromium. Now that chromium makes a big difference. Um, anything that is above about 12%, give or take, uh, chromium is considered to be a stainless steel. So that 5% chromium is not giving you a steel that's never gonna rust. So what's it there for? Well, the A stands for air hardening. Chromium, changes the heat treating characteristics of the steel substantially and it allows you to harden the steel by heating it up and then letting it cool in the air. Also, chromium carbides are harder than plain old vanilla steel, so by scattering these little blobs of chromium carbide through the steel, you get better abrasion resistance. It's used in tool rooms for fixtures, dyes, things like that. If you want to make a quickie die for blanking or punching or something like that, and uh, you won't be doing gazillions of versions of it, A2 is a really handy steel to use. But what about for knives? Well, before we answer that, let's look at D2. It's pretty similar in composition to A2, but with substantially more chromium. And as we saw with A2, chromium makes a big difference. Um, in, in the case of uh, D2, it's about 10 to 12%. So that means that D2 is actually much more resistant to corrosion than A2. So for tool and die and general shop use, that may be of value, it may not. But for knife guys, the advantage is really obvious. So as a result, D2 is used way more than A2 uh, for knife making. Now it used to be that uh, getting hold of cutlery steels like 440C and that sort of thing in reasonably small batches uh, was 
kind of difficult. But now, you know, everything's available on the internet. I think a lot of uh, fewer knife makers are kind of going right out of the gate to D2 and, and sticking with it for their career. Still, excellent uh, steel really uh, makes very, very nice knives. You can make it quite hard without it being too brittle and it'll hold an edge for a long, long time. As far as corrosion resistance goes, well, I bought this Bob Dozier D2 knife about 20 years ago and it's been sitting in a glove box in a variety of my cars, including several abused by my son with water dripping in it and Georgia humidity and all that and look, barely a scrap of rust. Take that for whatever it's worth. Now there are a lot of other tool steels out there, most of them not so useful for uh, knife making. Uh, but uh, for those of you who may not be interested in knife making or just want to expand your uh, knowledge base a little bit, let me talk about some of those other steels. Um, S-series steels, S5 and S7 are probably the most common ones that you'd run into, uh, are shock resisting steels. They have uh, added molybdenum and silicon, sometimes some other alloying elements uh, that increase the toughness of the steel. I've used some of these for swords, and they're really not bad for that. Uh, probably wouldn't use them for knives, though. L-series, also known as low alloy steels, that's what the L stands for. Uh, L6 is probably the most commonly known one of those. Again, um, very shock resistant, um, and uh, again, not necessarily that great for knife making, but um, can be good for, for sword making. Howard Clark, for instance makes uh, Japanese style swords out of them. Kind of a special use thing though. H series uh, steels are considered to be hot work steels, meaning that they can be uh, used at very high temperatures without losing their hardness. Uh, H13 is a pretty commonly available uh, grade of that. Um, they're useful mainly for injection molds and you know other kinds of industrial uses where things are gonna get really, really hot. Unless you're planning to make a knife that's going to be used on Venus, not so useful for knife makers, though. Kind of along the same lines are the M-series steels, uh, which also retain uh, hardness at high temperatures. Uh, they have a fair amount of tungsten, and that makes them so that you can heat them up uh, to very high temperatures, and when they cool back down, they'll retain essentially, more or less, their full hardness. When you see uh, things that are labeled HSS or referred to as high-speed steel, especially drill bits, um, these are made from M-series steels, typically. Um, Pre-hardened lathe tool blanks that you'll see sometimes in industrial um, supply catalogs. Again, high-speed steel, typically an M-series steel. Again, if you're making lathe tools, that's what you want. Not so great for knives because they tend to be more brittle than typically used knife-making steels. All right, so one last kind of general point here. Um, you know, I get people contacting me all the time who said, well, I got on these forums and I've looked around online and there are all these people giving different advice about, you know, what kind of steel and how to heat treat it and whether this is useful for a knife or not. And, and I think, you know, a lot of times people, they hear all this stuff and they just don't know where to start and they're kind of frozen in the water. At a certain point, you just gotta jump into the pool and try something out. Um, you know, buy a small quantity of something that seems like it might work for you, chop off a little piece of it, test out a heat treating technique, and see if it gets hard. You know, you can stick it in a vise and whack it with a hammer, and if it breaks, then you know that it's hardened. Bear in mind, you know, I'm always talking about heating something to cherry red and dunking it in a bucket of oil. That kind of heat treatment is all very good and well, but if you really want to optimize something, um, for a particular use, you want to sell your knives for a bunch of money or you're trying to make some kind of industrial part, you really need to get your heat treatment dialed in. And that may require more complex heat treating equipment, uh, higher level of knowledge. That's just the way it is. But don't let that stop you from just going out there and experimenting and trying something out and seeing if it'll make a good knife for you. If you want to know more about these steels, Google is your friend. If you Google 01 technical data sheet, uh, you know, S7 technical data sheet, whatever it is, um, this will pop up. Now the manufacturer will tell you in a technical data sheet all about the composition of the steel, uh, recommended heat treatment, um, all kinds of useful information. If I were to make a really general statement and recognize that really general means not useful in some situations, 
Um, if you see chromium in a steel, you probably want some kind of professional heat treating equipment to heat treat it. On the other hand, anything that says water hardening or oil hardening is something that you can heat treat reasonably effectively with reasonably simple uh, heat treating equipment. Sometimes just a blowtorch and a bucket of oil. Simple summary, like I said earlier, all things being equal, if you don't have a lot of experience and fancy equipment, uh, you can't lose by starting with O1 steel. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!